All right, good morning. It's good to see you all here. My name is Jason Thomas. I am the student pastor at our Pecola campus. I was excited to be able to come here and, and speak with you this morning. I'm always really excited when Jason asks me if I want to come speak because it kind of gives me the opportunity to come here and see our Poto campus. I know a lot of times uh, for me, it feels like we're almost two separate churches because we've got Poto and Pecola, don't see a whole lot of each other, but coming here and being able to fellowship and worship with all of you really brings back that sense of community that we have here. And so it's, it's always just such a blessing to come and speak with all of you. And so last week we began our series on Advent, as you saw uh, on the buffer there, we began our series on Advent. And today we're going to continue that series. And in order to better understand not only this message, but the ones to follow, I just want to kind of put out a reminder of what Advent is means to us, what it is. Um, So Advent is described, as Jason said last week, is described as a time of expectant waiting and preparation for both the celebration of the birth of Christ, but it's also a time of expectant waiting and preparation for the return of Christ at the second coming. So we're preparing for Christmas, we're preparing for the end of the month when we get to celebrate and, and rejoice in who Christ was and what he did for us on the cross, but it's also looking forward to the second coming of Christ. And so last week as we opened up the series, Jason spoke with us about looking forward to the second coming of Christ, and he had a a few things to say about that. I want to kind of take a step back and and review what he talked about, because if you're like me, those things can kind of seep out and be forgotten. And so I want to go over some of those notes from last week. He reminded us that we look forward to a time of no more suffering and pain. And that right there could probably just end anything else I could have said about last week because that's like, that's such a highlight. That's such a high note. It's something that as we are running the race, as we're fighting the good fight, we kind of run out of some, st- some steam. We can remember that and it can give us that encouragement that we need to keep going. That, you know what, everything we're doing here, it's not for nothing. That we are working towards a time when there's no more suffering and no more pain. So that right there is already such a huge highlight. But then he also reminded us that we look forward to the throne being established and kept by God himself, that no other kingdom will rise up against it, that no one will hold that place, but God himself will sit on the throne and reign victorious forever. So we look forward to that. Uh, Jason told us last week that Advent reminds us that something is coming and that we should be preparing for it. And that's something he spoke about specifically was the second coming of Christ. We're to be preparing and looking to that day. He urged us to evaluate our readiness for the second coming of Christ by asking ourselves some questions. And I have some of those questions here. The first question, are you living as a faithful steward of all that God has entrusted you? Now, when I read that, my first thought is, my finances? Am I, am I trusting him? Am I being a good steward of my finances? But beyond that, am I being a good steward with my gifts and my talents, my abilities, whatever God has given me to do in my life? Am I being a faithful steward of all that, or am I just hiding it under a lamp or under a basket? Are you ignoring the needs of others around you? Do you see needs and you turn a blind eye to it, or do you see a need that you can help meet and run to that opportunity in order to point to Christ? Are you denying yourself? Are you giving yourself to your purpose in Christ? Have you seen what Christ has called you to, and are you chasing after that, or are you ignoring it and turning from it? Are you confident that you are in Christ? Is there no doubt in your mind? And upon Christ's return, the second coming when he does return, would you be taken with him into glory or would you be left behind? The answers to these questions will help you know where you stand with Christ and how prepared you really are for his return. Don't count on having more time to ask yourself these questions and determine your readiness. Today, right now, is the day of salvation. We don't know when Jesus is going to return, right? Like the only one that knows is God, when God's going to send Jesus and say, collect my people and bring them home. We don't know when that's going to be. So don't count on having next week to ask these questions and prepare your heart. You don't know that next week is going to be here. We have to live our lives with a sense of urgency. I believe that's the message Jason was trying to get across last week, and it's the message I want to echo this week as well, is do not delay in preparing your hearts. When I was younger and, and I was living at home, 
there would be times that my room, my, my bedroom, would become uh, kind of a disaster, right? Like it was my main space. It was my area. It was kind of my safe point. It's where I did everything. I didn't really like come out of my room a whole lot. I played with my toys. I played video games. Everything I did was in that room. I didn't care what it looked like. Um, I didn't care if something was out of place. I didn't care about how many cups or bowls or dishes or whatever had collected in my room because I'm like, it's my place. Who cares? Every now and then, I would make the mistake of leaving my door open and my mom would walk by and she'd see the condition of my room. And by that point, the damage was done and she would get on me and be like, hey, you need to go clean that room. And so reluctantly, I would do that. I would go and I would take care of my space. Uh, but something extraordinary would happen in the process. It would take so much longer than it should have, right? This is probably like maybe two hours. It should be done and completed. Everything should be back in place and tidied and, and well kept. But what would, what would turn into like a two-hour job would end up taking the entire day. Because along the process, I would just get so distracted by every single item in my room. Some of you can maybe relate to that. I know my wife can because I've seen it. I've experienced it. You just, everything you pick up, you're like, wow, I haven't seen this uh, in ages. I have to look through every, you, you pick up a notebook. You're like, wow, what was, uh, what was second grade like? Let me look through every page in the notebook and find all these scribbles and sketches and try to remember what my headspace was in that time or, or find an old video game. Like, you know what? I haven't, I haven't popped this one in in a while. Let me just play a little bit of this video game and, and distract myself from what I'd been tasked to do. Now, ultimately, what would happen is my mom would come by to kind of check the process and, and see where I was and get me back on task, right? And so I would, I would pick up back where I left off, and then a few minutes later would just become distracted completely again. And so it would just be this long, long process. And if I'm being honest, I wasn't really putting my best effort into that, right? Like, in fact, I would find myself thinking, I just wish somebody would come do this for me. Or even worse, I would find myself thinking, if my mom wants this done so bad, why doesn't she just come do it herself? Now, I would never say that to her because I had more wisdom because I knew that would not go well for me. But I didn't put my best effort in that. Now, what I want to do is consider the actions of John the Baptist, who varied very greatly from how I conducted myself. If we were to look at the life of John the Baptist, it's someone that we could take some notes from. See, he was given a task, and he did it. He went straight to work, preparing the way and pointing to Christ. He didn't passively wait for someone else to do the job. He didn't just say, you know what, Jesus is going to come. He can take care of that work. He's more powerful than I am. He's greater than I am. He said those things, but he didn't say, I'm going to leave that work to Jesus. He said, I've been given a task, and I'm going to go to work. Now, if you've spent any time at all in the church, you've probably heard of John the Baptist. But if you haven't, I just kind of want to give some, some bullet points about who John the Baptist was. See, many would consider him one of the most theologically significant figures in the Gospels. His birth was recorded in Luke chapter 1, and he was someone that during his formative years when he was growing up as a child, he spent a lot of those years in the wilderness. But the start of his public ministry when he went out and began his work would end nearly 400 years of prophetic silence. So we had all these prophets that existed and were speaking the word and telling all these prophecies, and then it was quiet. And then you jump 400 years, John the Baptist comes onto the scene, and so now he works as a way to kind of bridge this gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He comes on the scene, and, and he's able to form a link there between those two sections of the Bible we know as the Old and New Testament. The central theme of John's ministry was repent, for the kingdom is at hand. He didn't mince any words. He didn't put it off. He said, you need to do this now. This is at hand. Repent now, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, John the Baptist was called such because his practice was to baptize those who would, who would accept and respond to the message he proclaimed and repented of their sins. John the Baptist, if he entered this room today, he would probably stand out quite a bit. Like I said, he, he was raised in the wilderness and lived his life in the wilderness and continued uh, to kind of act like somebody out in the wilderness. He was clothed in camel's hair, and his diet consisted of locusts and wild honey. So he would, he would stand out in a crowd, right? Like if he walked in here, we would, we would notice him. But the thing about John the Baptist is he wasn't a crowd pleaser. He didn't care if he stood out. He wasn't someone that was going to compromise his belief for others. And on more than one occasion... 
he willingly confronted the hypocrisy of the religious establishment of that day. He would go on to expose the immorality of King Herod and ultimately would die a martyr's death rather than compromise his convictions. So I think we have a lot that we could learn from John the Baptist. And so today we're going to be in Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to read about how John would do this work. He would complete this task of preparing the way for Jesus. So starting off in verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we, we just come to you looking at your word, examining these scriptures that have been given to us. We're looking at the life of John the Baptist, but more than that, we're looking at what he was pointing to, and that is your son, Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we go through this message, I pray that hearts would be preparing now, that they would be working to know you more, to see you more, and also to point others to you. So thank you once again for this day, and thank you for all you've done. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So John, he stated that Jesus, who was to come, was greater than he was, and that Jesus would have not only a more powerful ministry, not only would his work be greater, but the baptism that he had would also be greater, that it would be a more powerful baptism. John was the one who would hesitantly, he would baptize Jesus. Jesus would come to him and say, I want you to baptize me. And he'd say, no, I'm not worthy, but would do that. And then he would also allow his own disciples to leave his instruction and follow after the instructions of Jesus. So John the Baptist was not one to point at himself and say, hey, listen to my words, come follow me. He would say, Jesus is greater and proved it by allowing his disciples to leave his leadership and follow the leadership of Jesus instead. We know that John's ministry had a huge impact because if we look in the book of Acts, Paul uh, tells a time of when he found some disciples and when he asked them if they had received the Holy Spirit, they didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. They said, we've been baptized by John the Baptist in water. And so Paul would then tell them about Jesus, tell them about the Holy Spirit, and they would get baptized in the Holy Spirit and become disciples of Christ. But that just tells a little example about how far-reaching John the Baptist's ministry was. The work of John the Baptist, at least the work we focus on most during Advent, during this season, can be summarized in two statements. The first statement is that John was sent to prepare the way. He was the messenger alluded to in Isaiah's prophecy, and he was the one who was sent to prepare Israel for the Messiah, for Jesus. The second statement that can summarize John the Baptist's work is that John's mission and ministry served to point to Christ, not himself. John's voice was the one that drew people out of the wilderness. They came to hear him speak. They heard stories of how just a powerful speaker he was, and they came from the wilderness to hear his message. But the message he had pointed to another, not to himself, not to his work, but pointing to Jesus instead. So how exactly did John prepare the way? In verse 4, John calls people to repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He urges them to turn away from their sin and to turn to God instead. He called on those who repented to be baptized, not in order that their sins could be forgiven, but so that they would show signs of their true repentance. 
John was working to make sure that when Jesus began his ministry on earth, that people would recognize Jesus as God's son, that he had been sent to save them from their sin. So what, is, what does this mean for us? Like we see the work that John the Baptist did and we can say, okay, yeah, that's great, that's awesome. He, he did a lot of good things. But what does that mean for us today? Perhaps this Advent season, we have our own preparations we need to do. Maybe we need to take some time to get our hearts and our minds right, not only for the celebration coming on the 25th of December, but also for the second coming that Jason talked about last week. Now, we all know this year has been full of ups and downs, and probably more downs than ups, if we're being honest. It's been full of distractions and discouragements and just a lot of hate and just a lot of things going on. Maybe this Advent season we need to shift our focus from the things going on in this world and lean on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Even if we can't quiet all the noise, even if the distractions are too great, even if the discouragements are just too much to overcome, Jesus meets us where we are. He comes to us abounding in love, abounding in forgiveness, and abounding in understanding. Psalm 139, verses 3 and 4 says, You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Jesus knows what's on your mind. He knows your burdens. He knows your struggles. Maybe your preparation this season means laying your burdens on him instead of trying to rely on your own strength. John the Baptist's other purpose was to point to Christ. Now imagine with me for a moment that someone approaches you and they say, hey, how do I, how do I get to Pecola? Now how difficult would this be if you had no earthly idea where Pecola was? If you had no earthly idea who or what Pecola? You, you just had never heard that word in your life. You said... I have no idea. I'm sorry. I can't help you. How hard would it be to point someone somewhere you've never heard of? Now, my question is, how can you point some, someone to someone you have no familiarity with? See, preparing and pointing work in unison together. By preparing our hearts and our minds for Jesus, we are able to point others to him because we are familiar with him. So what happens in that moment when we stop preparing? What happens if we allow everything around us to distract us, all the discouragements, all the low points? What if we allow all of that to distract us? Well, we stop pointing to Jesus. We stop sharing the name of Jesus, and we stop spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist's purpose and ministry through all of his preaching and teaching and telling and baptizing was to point others to Jesus. You see, John was so effective in pointing to Jesus because he lived out the conviction of his message. And if we ourselves want to be effective in pointing to Jesus, we have to devote daily to the Word of God and live in relationship with Him. If we want to be effective in pointing to Jesus, we have to gather consistently with other believers who can come alongside us and walk with us in unison with Christ. If we want to be effective in pointing to Jesus, we have to commit to community with other like-minded believers in our body and do life together. If we want to be effective in pointing to Jesus, we have to serve faithfully, knowing that Christ has received all the glory and our works are evidence of our faith not actions trying to earn salvation. If we want to be effective in pointing to Jesus, we have to give sacrificially to the mission of Christ in order to see his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And if we want to be effective in pointing to Jesus, we have to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ who engage missionally and teach others how to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. Repent, that was John the Baptist's message. Repent and prepare for Jesus. Turn from your sin and turn instead to Jesus Christ, the propitiation of your sin, the perfect sacrifice made for you. 
I want to issue a word of warning. Don't make the mistake of falling into the trap of religion. It doesn't do any good. Repentance does no good if it means turning from one sin to another. See, the the scribes and the Pharisees, some of them made this mistake. Their actions, everything they did were seen as good. They were seen as righteous acts. They tithed, they gave, they prayed. All these were seen as good things. But they fell short when they started to seek their own desires rather than seeking the creator. They exchanged a humble walk with God for a prideful parade in front of others. They'd take the offering and drop it in the basket, hoping people to see how much they gave, hoping to hear how much fell. They exchanged a humble walk for a prideful parade in front of others. Rather than pointing to Christ, their lives were lived in a way that pointed only to themselves. In Matthew 5.20, Jesus says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And what we know about the scribes and Pharisees is that they had all these rules They had these laws they tried to follow, and they followed it really well. They knew the Bible really well, but they fell short when they had impure hearts. Jesus is calling his disciples to a different kind and a different quality of righteousness than that of the scribes and Pharisees. They took pride in outward conformity to extra biblical regulations, but they had impure hearts. Kingdom righteousness, the kind of righteousness Jesus is talking about, works from the inside out because it produces changed hearts and new motivations. With this changed heart, the conduct of Jesus' followers does in fact exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, not by their power, but by the power of Christ alone. So my question for you is where do you find yourself this morning? Are you preparing your heart so that God might use you to point others to him? Or if you're honest with yourself, do you identify more with the scribes and the Pharisees? And and do you find yourself going through the motions and taking pride in actions that only serve to make your name known? This morning, for our time of invitation, I want to echo the words of John the Baptist, which were, repent and prepare for Jesus. If you guys would pray with me. Father, we, we're so unworthy. If we're, if we're honest with ourselves, we take a real hard look at our lives. We are so unworthy of the love you have for us. We are so broken. We are so damaged. But God, you come and you restore and you You cover us in your righteousness. You cover us in the sacrifice that was made. The sacrifice we couldn't make. We could never earn what you have given us. God, I pray for the hearts in this room right now and and those that are online watching as well, that they would be preparing for you. Not just preparing to celebrate the birth at the end of this month, but also preparing for the second coming And that we would be pointing to Christ because people need to know your name. They are lost, they are broken, they are hopeless. God, people need you so much. So I pray that the people in this room would dedicate their lives to sharing your word. That they would dedicate their lives to being fully devoted disciples of Jesus because they have a faith, they have a hope that exceeds anything in this world. God, I just thank you for all the ways you show your goodness to us, for all the ways you continue to lift us up, even when we don't deserve it. God, just thank you for who you are and all that you have done. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.